Hi, my name is Elon Yogev. This is Joint Work with Alessandro Chiesa, and this talk is about tight security bounds for Michaelis snogs. So let's talk, and I'll start with a brief overview of what are snogs, succinct non-interactive arguments, in the random oracle model. So snogs in a row. So this is a proof system. So we have a prover, we have a verifier, we have some language, and we have this verifier that is wondering if uh, this instance X is in the language. The proof is non-interactive. So we have this single message, uh, proof pi, that the prover sends and the verifier uh, reads pi and, uh, and decides if to accept or reject. Um, the communication complexity, complexity is gonna be succinct. So in, in particular, the size of this uh, proof pi is gonna be much smaller than the size of the witness uh, of this uh, NP language. Um, and to get succinctness, actually, we have to sacrifice something. So what we're sacrificing is uh, the information theoretical soundness, and we're going to settle for computational soundness. So what is computational soundness in the random oracle model? So both the prover and verifier have a common resource. This is a truly random function. So this is random, the random function here. It uh, eats arbitrary strings and outputs a string of length lambda. And the soundness is as follows. We're going to say that the, the scheme has T epsilon security. So it has two parameters, T and epsilon, for instances not in the language. If for any T query unbounded adversary P, so the adversary has uh, unbounded computational power, but is bounded to at most T queries to this random oracle, so the probability over the random oracle that this prover outputs pi that makes the verifier accept the proof, I know that the verifier has access to the same random oracle, is at most epsilon, okay? When epsilon is a function of t and lambda. Uh, so t epsilon security means that if you perform at most t queries, you can convince the verifier of a false statement with probability at most epsilon. So why do we study snogs or in general, why do we study crypto in the random oracle model? So first, this is a very nice, very elegant information theoretic model, okay? There's no real computational assumptions here. We have a truly random function and then things are information theoretic. Um, and this allows us to uh, prove a lot of stuff, upper bounds and lower bounds. And these uh, proofs are usually uh, very tight, you can even get very, very close to the, to like very concrete and absolute constants. Uh, it's not only just a general model, we have some very beautiful constructions of, of snugs in the ROM. Uh, and you can take these constructions and if you want to bring them back to, to real life, you just heuristically instantiate the, the random oracle with some cryptographic, cryptographic hash function. These are usually considered as relatively lightweight uh, crypto. It doesn't involve things like uh, public encryption and, 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 and lattices and so on. And it's actually a very efficient way uh, to get post-content security. Okay, so we have all these attractive features of snugs in the row, and this is gonna be the focus of this talk. Um, so I talked about constructions and we're going to focus on, I would say, the main construction, okay, the beautiful construction of, uh, of uh, Mikali, uh, dates back to 94. It's going to be, it's a construction based on uh, Killian's interactive version where he uh, made it non-interactive using the Fiat Shamir uh, transformation. And in a high, high level overview, the construction is as follows. So uh, what we're going to do, we're going to take an information theoretic proof, okay, in our case a PCP. We're going to combine it with a cryptographic commitment scheme, okay, that supports local, local openings. These are going to be a, a Merkle hash. And together, what we're going to get is, is our uh, snog. So let me spell a few more details about this. So um, uh, I assume most of you at least saw or heard about this construction, but I want to take you step by step because uh, uh, we need to see uh, a few details. So the prover is going to start by writing a PCP for the statements, okay? So this is a PCP that can convince the verifier that indeed X is in the language, okay? The problem is that the prover cannot send this entire PCP because it's too large. Instead, the prover is just going to send 
a commitment to this uh, PCP, okay? So it computes this uh, Merkel, uh, Merkel tree of this PCP, and it computes this Merkel tree using the random oracle, of course. Now, um, the verifier is supposed to uh, pick randomness, okay, for the PCP that will tell him which uh, query locations he wants to read. And uh, we do not allow interaction here, so we're going to let the random oracle simulate the verifier, okay? This is called the Fiat Shamir transformation. So the prover is going to query the root, okay? So after he committed to the PCP, he's going to query the, this uh, root, the commitment, okay? So he's going to apply the random oracle to the root and use, use the output of the random oracle to derive PCP randomness, okay? So once the prover has this PCP randomness, he knows what, what are the query locations that the verifier wants to see. And the proof is going to contain the root uh, of the PCP, all the PCP answers, okay, that correspond to, to this location, and for each answer, an authentication path that assures us that indeed uh, the PC an PCP answer that he wrote here corresponds to the PCP that underlies this root. Okay, so this is the, the part of the, uh, of the prover. What is the verifier going to do? Well, he's going to verify that the PCP answer, so he's going to run the PCP verifier, okay, on this to, to, to make sure that the PCP is fine. And then he's going to check for each symbol, okay, in these answers, going to check the authentication path to, to make sure that indeed this is what the prover uh, intended to send. So what is the size of this PCP? Or very roughly speaking, uh, it's the number of Q, it's the number of queries of the PCP, Q, okay, so we need to, um, to open each location. And for each location, you have to send roughly a log n nodes, okay, on the, on the tree, and each node has a lambda bits output. So this is roughly the size of the proof. Okay, what about soundness? How do we prove soundness of, the, of, uh, of this scheme? So again, we, you, you use some underlying PCP, okay? So suppose you initialize the scheme with a PCP with soundness epsilon PCP, okay? The best soundness expression known is actually due to BCS a few years ago, and we're gonna denote the soundness with epsilon arg, okay? This is the soundness of our argument scheme. And as we said, it's a function of, of T and lambda. Uh, so the best soundness expression known is the following soundness, okay? So we have t times epsilon. t times epsilon is, uh, comes from the error of the PCP. So a cheating prover can just try to convince the PCP verifier, okay? You can do this, say, by just choosing a, a, a random proof and hoping that the verifier would be convinced, okay? And each time you might lose the probability of, of lambda. And he can do this roughly t times, okay? Because this is his query budget. And you can try to attack the random oracle. For example, you can try to find collisions, and that's why he's not really committed uh, to any specific string. And to rule out this, uh, you have to assume that he didn't uh, do magical things like find collisions or inverted the random oracle, and you, use, you lose this probability that comes from the birthday paradox. Okay. And... Uh, main question that we want to ask is, is this tight? Is this expression tight? Okay, this is going to be the focus of this work. And I want to point out that a negative answer would be excellent news, because if this expression is not tight, and you can actually prove a much tighter expression, then this in turn would yield a small argument size. Okay, and we're going to see this. So this part, I already hinted, is actually tight. Um, so the, the cheating prover can try to convince the PCP verifier roughly t times, okay? And each time he might actually lose uh, uh, an error of epsilon PCP, okay? So we have like a matching attack for this expression. For this expression, the answer is unclear, okay? So this tells us that, the, for example, the cheating prover is not going to find any collision. But what about vice versa? Can you attack the scheme if you are given a, a single collision? So I want to pinpoint on this question and um, I want to show you that the answer to this question 
actually depends on the fine details of the construction. And if you're slightly careless with the implementation, then one collision is actually very harmful. Okay, so let's try to see this. So consider the Michali construction, okay? And suppose we have a binary PCP, okay? So this is the PCP string here, okay? And every leaf think of uh, padded up up to length lambda, okay? Because we want to hash uh, uh, two lambda bits to lambda bits. This is the Merkel hash, the Merkel tree. Um, so if this is the construction, then we can reuse a single zero and one collision Okay, so you can find the collision in the leaves between 0 and, and 1, and you can reuse this uh, collision everywhere. Okay, so if I found a collision here, I can use the same collision here and here and here and here and so on. Uh, so in this case, I'm almost not committed to any location of the PCP. So I can commit to, to something uh, random using this collision, and then when I see the, uh, the queries of the verifier, I can just open in a way that makes him uh, uh, accept. And if this is the case, then the soundness is actually optimal. Okay, we just have to rule this out and we have to assume that he found no collision. However, um, this can be trivially avoided by adding indexes. So when I mean adding indexes, we're gonna add a prefix ij for every node. Okay, to the value of every node. Okay, these are like constant prefixes that, that, that just mention their location in the tree. Okay, so the leaves are gonna be layer one. Okay, so we're gonna add the, the one. And then we have like, this is node one. And this is the first node in level one. This is the third node in level one uh, and so on. Uh, and now you can ask, is the soundness optimal? Um, so let me just mention that once I find a collision here, okay, I can actually, I can't reuse it here, okay, because the prefixes are going to be different. So a collision here doesn't give me anything here. And if I want to find a collision here, I have to walk again and find a new collision, okay? So I cannot reuse my computation. And more importantly, I cannot reuse the success probability. So if I had some success probability of finding a collision here, the probability that I find many, many collision is going to uh, decrease very fast. Okay, so with this implementation in hand, okay, with the, with the prefixes, I can state our result. So we give a negative answer to this question and we show that the, it's not tight. Okay, and I remind you that negative answer means good news. Okay, and what we do, we actually show a tight security bound for Mikali. So our main theorem is that the uh, security expression for Mikali is the following, the same t times epsilon that we had before, okay? But instead of this t squared over two to the lambda, we have t over two to the lambda, okay? And we have some other small expression here that replaces the four, okay, C, capital C, which depends on uh, L, the length of the PCP, and log sigma, where sigma is the alphabet of the PCP. Okay, so this is the expression we have, and this expression holds provided that lambda is not too small. Okay, so it has to be at least 2 log t. Uh, we show an almost matching lower bound, so this is tight, and even inside C, this expression is almost tight. Okay, so uh, we have a matching lower bound. And as I promised, this has implications on the argument side size. So using the previous analysis, if we wanted t epsilon security, we had to set lambda to be log t squared over epsilon. Okay, this is what you get if you uh, require the success probability to be at most epsilon. Using our analysis, we can set uh, lambda to be the maximum of these two expressions, but you can see that it's uh, smaller than this expression. Okay, so uh, let's say that this is the maximal one depending on the values of t and epsilon, uh, then lambda has to be only log t squared and not log t squared over epsilon. And again, this gives us a smaller argument size because as we said before, this is the argument size, it's q times lambda times log n. So these two things are uh, like a constant and we, we are making uh, lambda better. So any factor that we improve here, we, we, we gain the same factor in the argument size. 
Um, we worked quite hard to make sure that uh, all the constants and our theorems are very, very tight, okay, and have a very concrete and good constants. And what we show is we, we get actually concrete efficiency as well. So in this table, we're comparing our analysis to the best prior uh, analysis of uh, Mikali. So we took the, the same uh, PCP with soundness and some proof length, okay, to 30, and we amplified it. And uh, depending on uh, T and Epsilon, you can, show, you can see the results here. So in red, this is the size of the argument in Mikali schemes, and in blue, it's, uh, it's our scheme. And you can see that overall, depending on the values of T and Epsilon, we get a, a, an improvement between uh, 20 to 40%. Okay. Um, another thing that I want to mention, this tight analysis actually led us to a new construction. Okay, so this is a subsequent work that you can uh, see in the last crypto. And the new construction took the tight analysis and managed to overcome and circumvent all the bottlenecks in the analysis. Uh, and what we got is that the, the new construction has, uh, has soundness just t times epsilon, okay, with, this, with the same requirement on lambda. And this actually gives a much better argument size, both concretely and actually even uh, asymptotically. And I really welcome you to see the paper on imprint. Okay, so now I want to dive back in to our construction, okay, and the, and the analysis of our construction. So first, how the prior analysis worked. Okay, so we wanted security of Mikali snugs, right? What we did usually is we wanted to say, okay, the commitment scheme is really a commitment scheme. So we had to assume, okay, or condition on the event that there are no collision and no inversions. Okay, and that's why we lost this uh, probability in the soundness expression. Once we have this, then really the cheating prover has nothing uh, he or she can do except to commit to some PCP string and hope that the verifier uh, is convinced. Okay, so the security from this point on is reduced to the soundness of the PCP. In our case, we want the security of Mikali snug, but we cannot just condition on not finding collisions or inversions, okay? And we ha actually have to keep showing that soundness uh, holds even when the prover finds collisions or inversions, okay? What we're going to do instead, we're going to score the collisions or inversions, okay? And we're going to bound the probability that he finds more and more collisions or inversions. And then, given a specific uh, score, we're going to see how harmful this, this score is, okay? So we're gonna have some new game that, that we call tree soundness game. Uh, and this game has gonna, is gonna have a specific budget and we're gonna bound the probability of the, the adversary to win given this specific budget. And we're gonna um, uh, do this bound using a, a reduction to another type of game that we're gonna call, that we call re reverse soundness game. And this game we reduce uh, back to PCP soundness. Okay, so the analysis is very modular in this, uh, in this approach. This game really describes all possible strategies that the adversary can do. Uh, and this is an intermediate and very simple game that allows us to, to reduce all these possible strategies to something very simple. In this game, we can uh, like say something very meaningful just using the PCP soundness. Okay, so now I'm going to dive in uh, uh, these steps, okay, to give some uh, additional details, and we, we're going to start with the scoring collisions and inversions. Okay, so we're in, in this part of the proof. Um, so we introduce a scoring function, okay? The scoring function is a function of the query traces of the algorithm. So suppose you have a cheating prover, you can look at his, uh, its uh, query trace, okay? And then you can give a score to this query, uh, query trace. And this score is going to allow us to quantify the soundness even in the event of collision and inversions, okay? So let's first talk about the score, okay? What score do I give to a specific trace, okay? If the trace ha contains nothing interesting, it's not going to get a score. It's going to get a score when I see some rare events, okay? So one example of, uh, we have two kinds of uh, rare events. One, the first one is collisions, okay? So if I see a collision, I'm going to add one to the score, okay? And I have to define this slightly more precisely, okay? So what happens if I see a k-wise collision? 
okay, these are k elements that all collide to the same value, it's going to get a, k, a, a score of k, k minus 1. Okay, I'm going to add all these uh, scores. So this more or less counts the number of collisions in a given trace. Okay, the second thing is going to be about inversions. Okay, so inversion is another thing we don't want the, the adversary to do because then he can start by querying the root and seeing, uh, uh, and, and seeing the queries and then walk his way back and just derive the, the PCP that he wants that, uh, that convinces a specific verifier. Okay, uh, so we're going to count the number of inversions. So inversion is going to be a response Y, okay, that hit a previous query X1, X2. Okay, so remember that queries are, are rehashing two elements to one, okay, because of the Merkle tree. Um, so what we don't expect is to see a, an answer that hits something that we queried before. Okay, this is also relevant, and we're gonna uh, and we're gonna count these. And given this uh, scoring function, uh, what we claim and what we show in the paper is that any t algorithm for any t query algorithm, the probability that the that the score is more than k is bounded by something that you can already see comes from the birthday uh, paradox to the power of k. And this thing, this thing is not going to be very small. So this thing is going to be like a constant. So the probability that he finds a collision in our analysis is actually going to be some constant. Okay, so we can most definitely not rule out the, the event that he finds a collision. Okay, but the probability that he finds k's collisions, this already decays exponentially fast in k. Okay, so before I go into the other parts, okay, the three soundness and everything, I just want to show you how using this, and we're going to have a step that you're going to believe me and I'm going to uh, show you later, okay, how I can conclude the proof, okay, so this will show why this is useful. So what is the probability that the verifier accepts, okay, suppose that X is not the language and I want to bound the soundness error. So this thing I can always do. I can always do this infinite sum and say, okay, it's the probability that verifier accepts conditioned on the adversary, okay, getting a score of at most k times the probability of getting a score of most k. Okay, so this is just a sequence of, uh, an infinite sequence of events and I can just uh, sum up the probabilities of all these, uh, all, all of these things. Okay, so this is using the scoring function. So now, now I can focus on one specific k and ask what is the probability that the verifier accepts? Okay, what the probability that the chief team prover succeeds? If I condition on him getting a score of at most k, so if k is three, means I cannot find four collisions. He has a budget of three collisions. So what's the probability of succeeding with this specific budget? This is exactly why we introduced this uh, game, tree soundness game. Okay, so this is really by, uh, by the definition of the tree soundness game. Uh, okay. Now, this is a step that, of course, I didn't show yet. Okay. Uh, this is going to be lemma one plus two. Okay, that we're going to just briefly see. Uh, and uh, this, uh, the probability of getting a score K, okay, this is the claim that we, we have on the uh, on, on, uh, uh, and the scoring function. Okay, and we're going to see this expression. I just maybe just point out already that what we see here is this is actually the cost we get from collision. So we have the same t and epsilon as before, okay, as in the original uh, uh, soundness expression of Mikali, but we pay another factor here of 2 to the k. Okay, because if he has a score of k, this gives him a lot of power. It gives him exponential in k uh, power. Okay, and this is going to come from uh, the inversions part. Uh, but now we can just take everything that depends on that doesn't depend on k. We can take it out, and we just get this the same expression. Okay, just uh, rewritten differently, and then when we look at this infinite sum, okay, that depends on k, and now here comes the condition that lambda is slightly more than two log t, then this infinite sum is going to converge, and we're going to be left with uh, the the soundness expression that we want. Okay, so really what's missing is for me to give you analysis why if you're limited to a, a budget of k, 
Okay, in this three soundness game, uh, I, I need to give you some bound on the, uh, of the soundness of this game. Okay, and lemma one plus two is gonna be about the three soundness and the reverse soundness game. Okay, so now we're moving on to the three soundness game. So we introduced this intermediate information theoretic game, okay, three soundness game. It has two parameters, okay. T is the number of uh, actions, okay, this corresponds to the number of queries the adversary has, it's, okay, in the game it's the number of uh, actions he can do. And K is some bad budget, okay, it's going to be the collision and inversion budget. The game is planned on a graph, okay, it's planned on a graph, and, uh, um, and in, in every, you have this infinite loop where the prover can choose one of two actions, okay, the first one is adding an edge. The second one is deriving PCP randomness. Okay, we're going to see this in a second. Every time he chooses an action, the, the budget T decreases by one. Okay, and when we get to zero, we stop. Uh, okay, so what is this graph? So the graph already contains uh, all possible nodes. And uh, what the cheating prover can do, he can add edges from this set. Okay, so this is the complete uh, set of edges and you can choose one and add it to the graph. So what are these edges? So remember in the construction, we have the prefixes i and j, okay? So every node, we know exactly where it is, okay? So these are these i and j's here, okay? So we have levels and the i is gonna be the, uh, the level of the node, okay? So we're always connecting nodes from level i to two nodes in level i plus one, okay? For example, here, so we have, uh, this is level i and two nodes in level i plus one, okay? And if you connect it to some position j, and these are the corresponding uh, positions, okay, in the next level. And the h values are just like the, the actual hash, the output of the, of the oracle. This is something that he can completely uh, specify, okay? So uh, this is the complete set uh, of edges, and you can choose from here and, and add it to the graph. However, we didn't talk about the budget, okay? What ha happens to the budget K? Okay, so if he just adds an edge, let's say he added this edge, fine, he just adds it and uh, T decreases by one, okay? What happens if he adds a collision, okay? So let's, in this example here, okay, we have the node U and he added this, this edge here and the V primes, okay? So we have a collision here. Uh, he's allowed to do that, okay? But each time he does this, the, um, uh, the collision budget decreases by one, okay? And of course, once we got to zero, that's it, okay? You cannot uh, continue beyond zero. Okay, so that was the easy part. What about inversions? Uh, inversion is, uh, is uh, the harder part to add, okay? So the prover also has a budget of K inversions. And this is slightly harder to model because a single inversion actually allows him to win, okay? So if he can invert something, he can just, uh, uh, he can just uh, uh, compute a root and then compute the corresponding uh, PCP that is good for this root and then just invert back the function to connect the two. So we're not gonna allow arbitrary inversions, okay, or, or something called strong inversions, these are going to be disallowed, okay. Instead, what we're going to uh, allow is weak inversion, okay, I'm going to try to um, tell you what is the difference. So, a strong inversion is going to be when I have some value y, okay, and I want to find some x such that f of x equals y. This is a strong inversion, okay, I particularly inverted y, okay, corresponding to this function f. Uh, uh, what is a weak inversion, okay, which is allowed? The weak inversion is where I give you a large subset, okay, of y1, y1 up to ym, and then you're gonna uh, find x that inverted one of them. Okay, this is a much easier task, and this is gonna be uh, allowed, and let me show you how this uh, goes back to the graph, okay? So, if the Prover wants to add an inversion, okay? So inversion is adding a, um, an edge to a part of the graph that's already connected, okay? Then he can specify i and j, 
but he cannot specify h, okay? So if this node here is already connected and he wants to add now these to this edge here connected to here, this would be an inversion, okay? So he can specify i and h, but he cannot specify the specific h of this node. Instead, h is going to be sampled from the all possible potential capital H, okay? So what is capital H? So capital H is going to be all the H's for which this node I, IJH uh, he cannot connect to, okay? If there's some H such that IJH is just free and he can connect to and it's not considered inversion, then fine, just, just do that, okay? You take all the nodes that all are already connected to some component and this is going to be the capital H, okay? And now an edge is added only with probability the size of this capital H over two to the T. Okay, if you're slightly confused, let me give you two examples. I think they'll make things uh, easier. So when H equals one, let's say it just started and I have only one node that's connected to something and he wants to do an inversion. And then sure, he can say, listen, I give you IJ, I want to do this inversion. And capital H contains only this particular node. Okay, so this is actually a strong inversion. Okay, so right, this is a strong inversion, but we're gonna add this edge only with probability one over two to the, one over two t. Okay, and maybe more importantly, I wanna uh, I wanna mention that every time he he does this, the inversion uh, budget decreases by one, regardless of whether the edge was added or not. Okay, so he can try to do a strong inversion, but it's gonna happen with very small probability, and it costs him an inversion budget. Okay, the other side, he can make H very large. Okay, he can make H the largest possible is T. Okay, you can have at most T and nodes connected because he has to connect them first. This would be a very weak inversion. Okay, but it's added with probability half. Okay, so you can have, you can have uh, many potential nodes and then you're gonna be, you're gonna add the edge with higher probability Okay, but your edge is gonna be added to a randomly uh, node from H. So you cannot really specify exactly where the inversion is gonna be. You have a, a big bucket of nodes, potential nodes. You say, I want an inversion with one of them. And with high probability, you have an edge that connects a random one. Okay, so this is like the trade-off between a strong and a weak inversion. And of course, he can do anything on this trade-off that he wants. Okay, so that was the tree soundness game. And the tree soundness game really captured all possible st strategies of the adversary. And that's actually what we show. We show that any adversary for the original snarg, we can translate to an adversary uh, in the tree soundness game. And now what we do, we introduce a new game. Okay, and I'm gonna present it here, a very simple uh, form of this game called reverse soundness. And what we show, we reduce every uh, adversary to the, of the tree soundness game to the to adversary to this reverse soundness game. So the reverse soundness game is the following. It's called reverse soundness because we're gonna reverse the roles of, in a standard PCP, you first commit to PCP, and then you choose randomness, right? And we're gonna reverse this roles, so we call it reverse soundness. So the game is as follows. The, we start where the game first samples row one up to row T. Okay, so this game has some parameter T. And these randomnesses, these are randomnesses of the PCP verifier. Okay, so we start by sampling randomness for the PCP verifier. Okay, very weird, but we sample a lot of them. Okay, so row one up to row T. Only then, okay, this is given to the prover. Okay, and the prover as a function of these randomnesses, he submits a proof pi, okay? But then the game samples a random index i, okay, and the prover wins if pi convinces the PCP verifier with randomness rho i, okay? So we choose a lot of randomnesses. The prover as a function of this chooses the proof pi, and then we choose a random one, okay? And he wins if, uh, if pi convinces the PCP verifier with randomness rho i. Okay, this is very similar to the weak inversion we talked about earlier. And our main result here is uh, we show that 
you can reduce tree soundness, okay? You can do the, the success probability of a cheating pover in the tree soundness game. You can reduce it to the reverse soundness game. And then you can reduce this back to the standard PCP soundness. Okay, so let me just specify the two lemmas. So if we have epsilon tree, that is a function of, of T and K. Okay, so you have T actions and K is the budget. The reverse soundness has only this one parameter, K, T. Okay, and the first lemma says that uh, the winning probability in the tree soundness game is this expression. Okay, so it's T times epsilon PCP because I can always just try, okay? And actually every time I try I have an advantage of two to the K. Okay, these are because of the collisions. And I have this additional term, this comes from the inversions. So I have two to the K power times my probability in this uh, reverse soundness game. Okay, and these are due to inversions. And then the second lemma says that, okay, what is this epsilon reverse? Okay, this epsilon reverse actually is something we can bound. And this bound actually just depends on the parameter of the PCP, such as the, uh, the length of the PCP and the alphabet, provided that the PCP that you use had a, has a good enough soundness. Okay, so it's not like a smooth expression with, in terms of epsilon PCP, but once you have this condition, we can bound the, the reverse soundness. And now you plug these things in back in the original expression that you, we saw, and we can uh, conclude the proof. Okay, so conclusion. We gave uh, a new and a tight analysis of Michaelis snarg This is a new upper bound and a matching lower bound. Uh, to do that, we had to introduce some new PCP games, which I think is uh, uh, interesting on, on their own right, in particular this reverse soundness game. Uh, we actually got something, we got, a new, uh, we got new and smaller argument sizes, okay, both theoretically and practically. Um, some ideas for future work. First, what we, do, what we did, apply to Mikali's snog. And of course, if you want something really uh, efficient and practical, you're not going to implement uh, Mikali that uses PCPs. We're going to implement a new uh, modern version of it called the uh, BCS. Well, the construction is uh, similar in spirit, but it's, it's uh, based on IOPs. Okay, so IOPs, this is an interactive version of PCPs and they're much, much more uh, efficient and a lot of research these days on IOPs. Um, so the idea of future work is actually taking uh, what we did for one round, okay, of Mikalin 3 and apply it to BCS, where you have many rounds and in each round you have this uh, tree. Okay, so you would have to uh, kind of define the interactive version of these uh, PCP games, okay, to be like uh, IOP games. Uh, second thing is that, um, as we already mentioned, we can take this tight analysis and this gave us a lot of the ideas uh, for a better construction with a smaller argument size, okay? So future work, let's continue this, let's find better construction of SNARKs in the random oracle model. And I didn't define this explicitly, but there is the uh, very big open problem of can you achieve a linear argument size of snarks in the random oracle model? So both uh, the Mikali and the BCS construction have something called the quadratic argument size, uh, which I didn't formally de uh, def uh, de define. Uh, but the hope is that the tighter and tighter analysis could lead us to a linear argument size, which would be very uh, amazing. Uh, so with this, I end. Thank you very much.